Okay, so we're recording. Okay, here we go. So um, in class, we talked about how um, the Great Depression had started after the stock market crash. Remember, that was the spark that led to the Great Depression beginning. And we talked about um, Herbert Hoover and his response to the Great Depression. Remember, his Great uh, Depression response was rugged individualism, where um, people work hard with no help from the federal government. Zoom out just a little bit there. Okay. Um, the only other thing that um, is in your study guide that we need to know that Hoover did in response to the Great Depression is the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Remember that was when the federal government um, gave loans to businesses, but it didn't provide um, much. It only provided about 20% of um, what it was able to provide. Let me just change one thing here. Okay, um, and then um, the last thing that we need to know about Hoover's presidency is the Bonus Army. Remember, those were World War One veterans who wanted their retirement bonus early. Um, they went to Congress to protest for that money, but Congress said no. Um, some veterans would leave. And so Hoover called the army to make the veterans leave. And this turned the American public against Hoover. Okay, so that's that's where we left off. I'm going to that quickly because every class has gone to that. Um, that's the only thing you need to know about Hoover. Okay. So later that year, we have the election of 1932, where FDR beats Herbert Hoover. Um, so right away, FDR is going to reach out to the American people and try to explain to him, explain to them how he is different than Hoover. Remember that people blamed Hoover for um, for not acting fast enough or not doing enough to fix the Great Depression. Remember they called um, the encampments, the shanty towns, they called them Hoovervilles. Um, so they're kind of blaming Hoover for not fixing the Great Depression. So Roosevelt really wants to show how different he is. And so he's going to share with the American public how he is going to fix the Great Depression. And he does that through his, um, his radio shows that are going to draw um, millions of listeners every week and they're called the Fireside Chats. It's FDR's radio show. And initially in the beginning of the Great Depression, it's all about how the New Deal, which we'll talk about in a second, will fix the Great Depression. And so people are listening to this radio show um, and it's his way of connecting with the American people, but also so they know what he's doing to fix the Great Depression. Let me see, there's... Yeah, I'm just gonna go back uh, one slide. Um, to describe his plan. So what is the New Deal? If rugged individualism is Hoover's plan for fixing the Great Depression, the New Deal is FDR's plan. 
So the New Deal is all about um, fixing the Great Depression through um, action by the federal government that includes um, giving people jobs. And we can actually see um, on the right-hand side of the um, the PowerPoint there is a quote from his inaugural address. The famous quote is, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But really, the next paragraph, he actually is really his thesis statement um, of what the New Deal is and what he's going to do. Our greatest primary task is to put people to work. It can be accomplished in part by direct recruiting from the government itself. So the best ways to um, help our economy grow is when people spend money and when the government spends money government spending and consumer spending and so roosevelt believes that if the government spends money on jobs one the government is spending money that'll help the economy grow but then also when people are getting that money they'll be able to buy things and that will help the people grow or help the economy grow too okay any questions so far if i'm going too quick just let me know remember if you have any questions you can put it in the chat I believe I have it set up so um, you only, if you're watching, you're only seeing on uh, the PowerPoint and um, the Google Doc. I don't think anyone else can see the chat except for me, if you're sending it just to me. Okay. And so um, initially, FDR says, okay, we need to fix uh, the problem with the banks. I think in all of our classes, we talked about how um, bank runs were terrible for um, the system of the banks because everyone's coming to get their money out of the bank at the same time. The banks don't keep your money just in the vault in the back. They're using it to give to Mr. Barth to buy his minivan. They're giving it to that person to buy a house. They're giving it to that person to go to college. So they're using their money for all this stuff. When everyone comes to get their money from the bank, the bank doesn't have all that cash on hand. And so it has to start going to the person with the van and say, hey, you need to give us this van um, or pay it off right now. They're not able to do that. And so banks started going uh, out of business. And if you had your money in the bank when it went bankrupt, um, you lost your money. And so people don't trust banks. They don't think banks um, are safe anymore. So Roosevelt has to fix that. He does that through the FDIC. So this is the beginning of all of the programs that the New Deal will do. The New Deal has, is, consists of a bunch of different programs and groups and organizations and, and, um, and they're all, they all have acronyms in them. And if you look at your study guide, you'll see there's a whole bunch of acronyms. It's really not very convenient for us as a history student. So my suggestion for you in all of these different programs um, is to make note cards for them um, just to help you remember what is the acronym and what does it do? You do not need to know what the acronyms stand for. Um, and actually, if you um, are looking at your study guide, you'll see the FDIC is not on your study guide, but the Glass-Steagall Act is. I don't care that you know the name of the act that made the group. I just want you to know the FDIC. So here's what it does. It protects your money in the bank. If the bank closes, the government will give you money back. Okay. And so the whole idea for this is that people will trust banks now because you're not worried about a bank run. You're not worried that the banks are going to shut down and you'll lose everything because no matter what happens, even if the bank closes, the government will give you your money back. And so this is a way to help um, um, protect your money in the banks so that the banks don't um, shut down. And we can see in this graph how this is very successful. Um, in the 1930s, uh, there are thousands of banks that are closing. But after the FDIC, it drops down to 57 the following year. And in about 10 years, uh, there's zero banks closing. So this is a very successful um, program.
Um, next is the AAA. The AAA is a program that is designed to fight one of the long-term causes of the Great Depression. One of the long-term causes was agricultural overproduction. Remember that led to um, prices being very low because there was a high supply. And so economists know that they need to lower supply. So here's what they'll do. Um, the government will pay farmers not to plant on their whole field. Okay, so if you have your giant field of corn, um, they'll only grow on half of it. And the idea is this would lower supply and raise prices. Okay. And so this is going to help farmers because the price per pound will increase, but they're also getting paid for all that land that they're not using. So that's the AAA. And I think this is the last um, slide that any power or any uh, hour has gone through yet. So this is the last new one. This is the NRA. This is not the National Rifle Association. That will come later. This is the National Recovery Act. Basically, it's to uh, the government is directing, directing factories um, so that they, here, I'm sorry. They're directing factories um, to create uh, price limits and wage um, floors. So basically that they're not going to pay their workers any less than this um, limit. Eventually, um, some factories are really not gonna like this um, and they're actually going to sue based on it, but we'll get to that. Uh, later during this. Hold on one second. Hi, everybody. I'm back. We just have two boys who are fighting taking a nap. And that's the reality of being a parent on a snow day. Anyway, I get to be with you and I don't have to deal with it. Perfect. Okay, um, next. So the rest of the slides are all new to everybody. So I'll go a little slower with these next slides. Remember, I am filming this. So if you need to watch this later, um, you can always rewind and you can watch this again. So um, there's a few programs here. Um, I'm not gonna have you write down all of them, um, but for this one, I'm gonna have you write down FARA and then the CCC. Um, so basically FARA is when the federal government give money to states to help the people. So um, this is the federal government giving money to like the state of Wisconsin and then the state of Wisconsin can decide how they want to give that money out. In some states, it looked like giving out checks to people, kind of like they did with coronavirus where they gave checks out to adults. Um, it could look like that. In some states, they said, well, we want them to work. So they maybe have to do some type of job in order to, um, to get that, uh, to get that money, okay? So that's FARA. Um, we do not need to know the CWA, we can skip that. But um, one of the most important ones is the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, this is one of the most important uh, because it is going to have a major effect on um, the young men who are working on it. Many of these young men who are gonna work in the CCC will eventually join the army during World War II. Uh, so CCC hires young men 
to work in outside um, labor jobs. So this could be like building roads, um, uh, parks, hiking trails. You know, if you go to um, uh, Devil's Lake State Park, a lot of the hiking trails and actually some of the buildings were made by the CCC. And so you just got a whole bunch of guys going out um, there. Uh, you know, maybe they lost their jobs right out of high school because of the Great Depression. Now they're going out and they're working and they kind of create this like semi military um, environment for these young men. Um, and it's super successful. They plant trees um, in the, uh, the Great Plains. And we'll talk about why in a little bit. Um, so they're going to be essential to creating this idea that um, instead of just giving money to people, um, they should do something for the community. They should do something for society, and then we'll give them the money. Um, and so a lot of the programs that come after this are going to focus on that. And the programs like FARA, where some states give money directly to people, um, regardless of if they're working or doing anything, um, many of those programs go away. Any questions on these two programs, FARA or CCC? Okay. If I don't hear questions, I'll just assume that people are good. Um, we're going to skip HOLC, but we are going to talk about the FHA. Um, this is a program that it's not necessarily for giving jobs, um, but basically what it's going to do is it's going to be a way for the government to um, ensure home mortgages. So, uh, so this is a way to make it easier for people to, to get a home mortgage, to, to buy a home or, or to borrow money to buy a home. Um, eventually, however, the FHA is going to be used um, by uh, many state and local governments to segregate um, people of different races. Um, for example, the FHA would not insure home mortgages if um, it was an integrated neighborhood. So if white and black people were allowed to live in the same neighborhood, the FHA would not um, insure those mortgages, which makes it um, less likely that the banks would actually give those mortgages out. That's the FHA. Now, um, not everybody uh, likes these programs. Um, so I'm going to go down and say opponent to the New Deal. Um, so who doesn't like the New Deal? Um, many business leaders don't like the programs. Many conservatives don't like these programs. Um, many don't like how much money the government is spending. Um, many don't like how, how much the... Uh, the government is growing in its power. We can actually see that in this cartoon right here where FDR is supposed to be like the Oliver Twist. If you haven't seen that movie or read the book, um, he is asking for more um, from uh, the leaders of the orphanage, more food. And um, here we have this bowl. This will represent power and FDR is asking for even more power. Now, um, one group that will be against the, um, the New Deal is the Supreme Court. Um, initially, the Supreme Court is going to be um, pretty conservative and they're going to strike down some of the New Deal programs. So based on constitutional principles, they'll um, strike down the NRA, so it's gone completely. And um, 
the AAA. So they're just going to get rid of it. Okay. Supreme Court is more conservative. than FDR. So um, one way to think about this, and this would be a lot easier if um, if I was in class. So I'm, I'm going to see how this works. Um, I'm going to try to make like a little uh, spectrum. And Sandy, I see your question. I'll answer that in just one second. I didn't do that. I didn't want to do that. Why is it automatically doing that? Anyway, um, so a common way of describing uh, conservatives and liberals is by, um, and I'm sure you've heard it before, describing people as left or right. For the sake of convenience, because we hear about that a lot, we'll, we'll continue to use that, those phrases. So conservatives, I'll write it over here. Conservatives are people who want um, a small government. Okay. They're people who want little government involvement. They don't want the government to spend a whole bunch of money. They believe that the government is not very effective in its role as um, uh, helping the economy. They believe, like Hoover, that the economy should grow um, on its own. The government shouldn't get involved. So if I have like concern on this side, um, I'm going to just done this the first time. I was going to write like an H for Hoover here. Hoover, okay. Hoover is more conservative, okay. Compared to on this side, where we have a more liberal perspective, okay. Liberals, and in in what most people will describe it as, is left, which means we have um, big government. That's where they believe the government should get involved. The government is able to help fix the problems of society. Um, and so that would be someone like FDR. Here. Okay. Um, someone asked, uh, is this still the same today? Yeah. Um, generally, these are same principles. Um, so liberal and conservative. So conservative is typically more Republican, uh, wanting small government, uh, less government involvement, less government spending. And liberal is typically Democrat, more government spending, more government programs, uh, more government help. So um, so we put Hoover and FDR on this. It's not a perfect like spectrum and we're not gonna get into the nitty details of should they be right there or should they be move over left or right a little bit. But that's kind of where we are where we are. Um, I'm actually going to add some people to this list too, like um, the Supreme Court. Add them like right around here. Okay, for Supreme Court. Um, at this point, Supreme Court is pretty conservative. Okay. Um, they don't agree with FDR on the New Deal. And so that's why they strike down the NRA and they strike down the AAA. And so those programs are going to um, be gone for now, and FDR is not going to be happy about it. But others will say, well, maybe the um, the, the New Deal is not doing enough. Um, and there's a bunch of people who, who said that. One man we don't need to write down is Francis Townsend. Um, he would actually have uh, a radio show where he talked about giving an old age pension, kind of like that bonus that they were going to give to the veterans. They said, let's give that to everybody. Um, and we'll actually see something like that will happen. But the person we do need to know about 
and I'm going to add him to, I'll add him to the spectrum in just a minute, but let me write him down here. His name to Huey Long. Um, Huey Long was a critic of the New Deal because he believed um, the New Deal didn't do enough. He wanted the government to do even more. And one of the things he did or he wanted was something called Share Our Wealth Program. And Share Our Wealth meant uh, that uh, the, uh, the money of the rich would be redistributed to the poor. So basically they said, um, from now on, what he wanted to do, from now on, you cannot make more than a million dollars in a year. Any extra money that um, uh, you make over a million dollars, the government will take 100% of that and will divide it out to the rest of the people. And um, he actually gained a pretty big um, following from this. And so if, um, if I have my, um, my spectrum over here, Huey Long would be like over here, okay? Um, he's more liberal than FDR. Um, we would usually tend to say because he's completely changing how our system works, he's pretty radical. He has a pretty radical solution. So Long would go way over here. Okay, any questions on the spectrum that I drew or um, conservatives or liberals or radicals? Okay, no questions, we'll keep going. Um, so President Roosevelt now has um, been in office for, um, for four years and he's instituted programs like the CCC, like FARA, FDIC, and in some ways it's been successful. Um, the FDIC has stopped bank um, business banks from going out of business. CCC has hired um, hundreds of thousands of young men. Um, but in other ways, the AAA and the NRA um, were struck down by the Supreme Court. And so we, we couldn't really see yet um, if those programs would, would help. And at this point, um, inflation, I'm sorry, unemployment rate is still pretty high. When FDR became president, it was about 25%. After about four years, it's still around 15%, which is a big decrease, but still is a terrible unemployment rate for Americans. And so um, Roosevelt basically says we need to do even more to, um, to fix the Great Depression. So um, one thing he wants to do is protect workers. And I'm going to... Second New Deal, um, basically he says we're gonna we're gonna do like the New Deal Part Two, okay, the sequel, the Second New Deal, and so he's gonna get um, do even more to help workers. Um, in your study guide, it's the NLRB, and basically it's to um, protect labor unions. That's all you need to know about it. Um, they wanted the government to. Um, um, guarantee that workers have the rights to um, bargain for better wages or better working conditions. Because um, remember, in the 1920s, we have um, our uh, membership for labor unions decrease because there is the um, association that, oh, if you are part of a labor union, you must be a radical. And so Roosevelt is trying to give more power to workers through the NLRB. Um, he's also going to um, take on the ideas from um, uh, Townsend, uh, uh, Francis Townsend, um, and say, like, let's help um, people in different ways through social security. 
So um, when you are born in the United States, you are eligible to be a part of Social Security. Um, and when you're Social Security, this is still in, this is still true today. You um, uh, can get a retirement pension, okay, or an old age pension. So once you get to a certain age, um, the government will give you money. If you have a job today, you'll see that when you um, look at your checks, they actually take money out for Social Security. And the idea is that you are paying money into it now, and that money will grow over time. And then someday when you're old and gray, you'll get that money back, okay? That's Social Security. Um, but it's not just for Social Security, it's also for um, young people in working class families. So if there's a family who does not have a lot of money, uh, maybe they're not able to afford uh, their bills and they have children, the government will provide some um, monetary uh, help or aid for those families. Um, if there's a, a family who uh, lost a spouse and it's, it's a widow taking care of um, the children, or if the children um, have uh, disabilities, Social Security will help them. And those are really important parts of, social, of uh, the New Deal. And it's one of the programs that's still around today. Um, and I'm going to, now that I think about it, I'm, I'm just gonna put like a star next to Social Security and the star will mean that it's still around today. So Social Security is still around today. I think the NLRB is still around. I can't remember though. Um, but the FDIC is definitely still around today. So I'm gonna to do a star next to that as well. If you wanna put a star next to yours, you can as well. Any questions so far? I'm not going too fast. Okay. And so um, Roosevelt is coming out with all these programs in his second New Deal as a sign to the American people that he is not going to quit. He's going to keep going. Um, and so in the election of 1936, he runs again. And FDR win, wins a second term. Okay, and you can see it's actually even bigger of a victory than in 1932. And hearing that the public is happy with what he's doing and, and like that he's doing, um, FDR is gonna try to um, get the rest of the government to back him. Now, all these programs that we've talked about so far, like the Social Security, NLRB, CCC, all of those are things that basically Roosevelt tells Congress, hey, I need you to pass a law to make this group. And so Congress and the president are working together right now to make the New Deal. The one part of the government that's not helping is the Supreme Court. And we can actually see that in this cartoon right here. We have the legislative branch Congress who's playing a drum and they're following FDR who's got a drum too. They're working together, they're drumming together and they're walking together but the judicial branch, the Supreme Court is not. And so Roosevelt wants them to, um, uh, to join. So he threatens them. This is called court packing. Here's what he says. Roosevelt basically tells, um, says that the judges who are on the Supreme Court have been on there for too long. Um, and uh, he threatens to say, oh, well, um, if there's a judge on there who's really old, like in their 70s, and they're not retiring, um, we're just going to go and add another judge to the Supreme Court. Um, now, this is completely legal. There's nothing in the Constitution that says how many people can be on the Supreme Court. But it has been nine justices at this point for about 100 years. It still is nine today. So... Um, so this would be a big change. He's threatening to add six more judges to the Supreme Court. And since he's the president, he would be able to pick who they are. And so he would be picking all the people who support him. 
So he threatens to put new judges on the Supreme Court who would support the New Deal. Okay, this is called court packing. Um, once this happens, this is after the election in 1936, a lot of Americans were like, whoa, that's too much. Like, Roosevelt, you're trying to do too much by doing that. Um, a lot of uh, congressmen did not like uh, this court packing scheme. And so even some congressmen are going to kind of cool off on the New Deal and not support it as much. Um, it doesn't mean there will be no programs at this point, but there's some criticism for, for Roosevelt for, for uh, suggesting that he do this. Now, um, it's not going to matter anyway, because um, some of the judges will, um, will actually die or retire um, in the next year or two. So Roosevelt is going to be able to appoint new judges anyway. And those new judges that will come in will support the um, the New Deal. And so the AAA that they initially struck down, um, they actually will bring that back. Um, and so they will provide those services to farmers again after the Supreme Court goes through its change. Okay. Any questions? Um, we're going to, let's see, let me just check one thing, everybody, before I, okay, okay. um, there's one thing I want to mention on, um, this slide and it's deficit spending. So um, there's actually, uh, after Roosevelt wins his second term, we actually have um, the Great Depression get a little worse for about a year. Um, and we can actually see that in this graph right here, this is unemployment. So early on before the stock market crash, it's very low then increases throughout Hoover's presidency, but then starts to slowly go down with things like the CCC and FARA. Um, but then there's a little hiccup here in the 1937. That's this Roosevelt recession. Um, and so um, to try to fix this, Roosevelt says basically he's going to put even, um, he's gonna continue with programs by spending more money. And so this is called deficit spending. Deficit spending is spending money you don't have. Now, um, I would suggest like as an individual, as a person, deficit spending is a bad idea. Um, you know, unless you can pay like a monthly payment, like, right, if you don't have money to buy a car outright or a house outright, you know, it's okay to um, borrow money for that, um, you know, uh, if you can't pay your monthly bills, not a good idea to to buy a whole bunch of stuff. For a government, though, that can be effective, according to one economist named John Maynard Keynes. Um, he believes this could actually help the economy. Um, he believes that um, a country like the United States uh, can actually have a debt and that we can still grow, we can still have a strong economy. Um, the big question that comes from that is how much debt can we have? Uh, like right now in the United States, we have about $30 trillion in debt. Um, is is that the reason why we have high inflation? Probably not necessarily that, but um, you know, at what point is the debt too high? Um, we haven't really found it yet. So, yeah. Okay.
Now, I said before, um, some people who might not like the New Deal were business leaders. Here's one uh, law that's passed during the New Deal that the business leaders really didn't like. It's the Fair Labor Standards Act. And um, the big thing that this does is it um, mandates overtime pay. So um, 40 hours is basically the work week. And they say, if you work more than that for these types of jobs that um, you can get overtime, but it also creates a minimum wage. Um, at this point, minimum wage was 25 cents an hour. Um, does anyone know what minimum wage is today? You can put it in the chat if you know. Um, when I was when I first started working in Shopco, my minimum wage was five seventy. So, does anyone know what it is today? All the people are racing to the chat. Yeah, you're right, Evan. It's seven twenty five, um, and it's actually been seven twenty five since the year two thousand nine. So um, for the last 14, 13 years, 14 years, it's been 725 and it has not changed. Now states individually can change that. Um, some states uh, on the West Coast have changed that to a higher amount. And there's been some questions as to if they should change it again. Um, and then the question is, if you raise it by how much and what's the impact for that? Um, so. Those are just questions that people have still today about minimum wage. Um, most people who make minimum wage, I think it's the median age for people who make minimum wage is 23 years old. So um, it definitely affects you as young people of what minimum wage is, especially if they increase it. Um, let's see, we're gonna skip the CIO. Um, but we should talk about Eleanor. Eleanor Roosevelt is the first lady. And um, Eleanor Roosevelt is going to use her influence, her power in politics to basically um, push the, the president and the New Deal to do more for more people. especially for um, women and people of color, who traditionally on um, the New Deal is, has not been helping. For example, the minimum wage was set, um, but the minimum wage does not, um, is not apply for workers on farms. Remember we said um, that still at this point, a large contingent of African-Americans who are living in the South are working on farms. And so they do not get the benefit of a minimum wage. And so um, she's going to advocate for more programs for more um, for more people. Like the CCC did not hire women. Or they did not hire women um, in uh, um, in their job postings. But um, off of the CCC, they made a new program. They called it the She 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 that did hire women to um, work on outdoor projects. So. Um, she is really important to um, pushing the government to focusing on who else can they help and what else can they do. Okay. Um, I mentioned before, just a, a, a little bit ago, um, that the minimum wage did not apply to uh, um, sharecroppers who are working in the South. We talked about the AAA, um, uh, that remember that um, gave money to farmers so that they didn't plant all the fields. Um, none of that money goes to the workers of the field. It only goes to who owns the land. Um, and it actually led to um, many farmers uh, laying off people who work on the land. And so a lot of um, African-Americans who worked on farms in the South actually lost their jobs. And um, uh, didn't have a job anymore. And so some uh, black farmers tried to protect themselves um, by creating a labor union with um, probably the funniest acronym for a labor union ever, STFU. So um, yeah, anyway.
Um, we are going to write down the black cabinet. So um, Congress, or I'm sorry, the president um, is able to have advisors to him. Uh, the president is only one person. They can't run everything for the executive branch. And so they appoint people to run like the, the war department or the state department or the treasury, right? Those are official positions. Um, however, uh, not very much was being done by the New Deal to, to help people of color, especially African-Americans. And so uh, what ends up happening is in the 1930s, um, a, an informal group of advisors will start to be formed that will talk with Franklin D. Roosevelt and talk about how the New Deal could um, help more people. One of the leaders of this informal group called the Black Cabinet was Mary McLeod Bethune. Um, there's a picture of her there. Um, she would actually become um, uh, an appointed position in another New Deal program we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but the Black Cabinet is an informal advisory committee to the president about how the New Deal can help African Americans. Um, and so because of things like this, um, like the Black Cabinet, um, uh, many African Americans will um, continue this transition from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. Um, at this point, now about 70% of African Americans are voting for the Democratic Party, and that uh, percentage will continue to increase as the 1900s uh, move on. Indian New Deal. Um, during the New Deal, um, Congress also passed what's called the Indian Reorganization Act. And basically it allowed Native Americans to have more control over their reservations. So remember in the 1800s in the Dawes Act, the idea was they wanted to assimilate Native Americans into white American culture, um, have more government control over them. And now they're saying like, okay, you can do your thing. You can have your own governments. You can have your own leaders. You can vote for what you want to do. You can have your own laws, um, which on one hand is, is really good in giving autonomy, but also the government kind of used that as a way to say, well, because we're not telling you what to do, now we don't have to help you very much with the New Deal. Um, so New Deal agencies really didn't go in and help um, reservations. Uh, not very many New Deal programs were designed to help people on Native American reservations. And so unfortunately, unemployment rates um, and programs or unemployment rates were still very high for Native Americans throughout the New Deal and Great Depression. Um, we're going to skip this slide, um, but we are going to talk about um, Mexican-Americans. It's called repatriation. So we talked in the um, 1920s unit how um, for mexican American or Mexican immigrants, uh, the government really did not make any rules saying how many people could come, which resulted in um, hundreds of thousands of Mexican citizens immigrating into the United States. And the U.S. Uh, really welcomed them because remember, there's lots of agricultural overproduction. And so they want more people to work on farms in the Southwest. But in the 1930s, when unemployment starts going high, the government starts um, especially in Southern states, began accusing uh, Mexican immigrants for um, the economic problems of the time. They become scapegoats for um, the high unemployment rate, taking jobs away from other American citizens. And so um, uh, governments 
started deporting Mexican immigrants, including US citizens. Um, due to um, blaming them for economic problems. Um, so about 500,000 people were deported during this time period. Half of them were US citizens. Um, however, for Mexican Americans who were able to stay in the United States, many would um, uh, get jobs in programs like the CCC. And so their lives um, would improve through those programs. Um, there is still discrimination though in these programs. Um, especially in Southern states. Um, white and black workers would be segregated. So like in the CCC, where you have people who are um, working and living together, um, they would separate white and black workers. And unfortunately, um, that would be true for many Southern states um, and even in some Northern um, programs as well. Let's um, see where we're at. Okay, we have about 10 more slides. Um, you can answer this question in the chat. Um, do you wanna take like a five minute break and come back? Or do you just want me to power through and go through the last 10 slides now? What, what do people think? Power through or five minute break? Okay. Um, okay, I'm seeing lots of power throughs. So we'll power through. Um, if you need a break, again, remember you can take one right now. Um, this is being filmed, so you can always watch it later if you need it. Um, I'm guessing this will take me another 10 minutes. Okay, so let's power through. Let's do this. Here we go. Um, yeah, I think a couple of these slides will, will go fast too. Um, so it just so happens that um, in the middle of the worst economic disaster in American history, we have one of the worst environmental disasters up to that point in the United States, um, and that's in the Dust Bowl. What ends up happening is in the 1930s, um, there is a um, there is a drought in the Great Plains that lasts years, and um, the drought is getting so bad that um, the soil loses all moisture to the point where the dirt um, that you know should be clumpy and should be kind of moist and everything um, becomes almost like a dust. And that dust can be picked up by the wind. And you can see in this picture right here, it creates these giant wind and cloud storms. Um, the clouds could be hundreds of feet tall and miles long. In some cases, uh, soil was picked up by the wind and carried hundreds of miles away. Um, in some cases, they would even be picked up in the jet stream. And there's at, at least a couple times where um, the soil would fall down like snow in Washington, D.C., 2,000 miles to the east. And so um, with the Dust Bowl, this is going to affect people in the Great Plains. This is going to affect farmers. And the big question is, wh what do we do to, to fix it? Um, and many people, um, I think the next slide is about it. Uh, many people would leave. Um, let me say this. Would leave the Great Plains and move to places like California. Um, 
Arizona. Um, and so there's there's a lot of um, we're not going to go into it super in detail, but there's a lot of um, systems that were put in place that made the Dust Bowl worse. Um, they didn't do crop rotation. They um, didn't follow the topography of the land, which led to a lot of soil erosion. Um, a lot of digging up soil um, in very windy places. And so many asked the government, what, what is the government going to do to help? Um, and so I, I mentioned before the CCC, they came in and um, planted trees. Um, and that's why you see, if you go by a farm today, um, you'll see that there's trees that will go around the plants or around the farms. Um, and that's why it, it stops the wind from blowing too much. Or sometimes you'll see where um, they have a field going and um, there's like, it looks like different colors in the, in the land that's called strip farming because they'll grow one type of crop there one year and the next year they switch. Because if you grow the same crop in the same place year after year, it actually takes out um, the same nutrients out of the soil and eventually all that nutrient is gonna be gone. And um, the government is going to will buy land and turn it into national grasslands. So um, it'll never be um, become farms and it's, it's a way to um, keep the soil from blowing. Okay. So that's the Dust Bowl. Any questions about the Dust Bowl? Okay, we're almost there, everybody. Then we're done. Um, just a few more programs to mention. We have the TVA. This is the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, this is going to give jobs to people. Uh, was Wisconsin affected by the Dust Bowl? Um, no, not really. It was mostly um, places like from Texas to like South Dakota. Um, I'm sure they they suffered from a drought, but we don't see the the, the dust as much in Wisconsin. Um, so this program gave jobs to people to build dams and hydro electric power stations. Okay, so it's not only gives people jobs to build the dams and to run the power stations, but also they're giving power to the people living in Tennessee. And so this is a Another way that the government can say, hey, we're, we're providing this money for people, but we're also um, providing a service for, for society. Okay, that's the TVA. Um, the other one we should mention is the WPA. Um, they'll provide construction jobs and jobs in the arts. So, um, there's the Federal Art Project, which paid farmers, or farmers, if they paid uh, artists to go and draw the experience of the Great Depression in art. Um, you can actually see some WPA art nearby. If you go to the Columbus Post Office, there's actually a mural in there. And that mural was um, paid for by the WPA. Um, they paid musicians, they paid writers. Um, now there's gonna be some critics to this saying that, you know, why are we spending so much money on photographers or painters? Um, but many will, will highlight the importance of these artists um, in showing the experience of Americans during the Great Deal or Great uh, Depression. So future generations can see um, uh, what life was like. Um, See if there's anything else I want to mention here. I don't think so. 
Uh, okay, here's our last two slides, everybody, and then we're done. Um, this graph just shows us um, a couple things. This is gross national product. It shows how good businesses are doing. You can see in the 1920s, uh, the line is going up, which means businesses are doing good. Then the stock market crashes and it goes down until Roosevelt becomes president. And then it goes up. We have the Roosevelt second term. There's a little Roosevelt recession in 1937, but it's still going up. And then the next slide is also unemployment. So you can see before the stock market crashes, it's very low, but then skyrockets over the next three years until it's 25%. Roosevelt becomes present. We can see the New Deal is helping to lower unemployment rates slowly over time. You can see Roosevelt's second term. But after 1940, Roosevelt has been president for about eight years and unemployment still at about 15%. And so um, this kind of leads to economists to uh, debate today how successful was the New Deal? Um, did it actually work? And um, or would this have happened anyway? Um, you know, and that's that's a debate economists still have today. It's not a question we're going to answer. Um, we're more interested in um, how the programs work, why they were done, and uh, what were different perspectives on it. And then that's my last slide, everybody. So um, I'm going to stop sharing. Are there any questions from any, anybody um, before we're done for today? Any questions? What should we focus on for the writing section? That's a great question. Um, I would focus on, hi, uh, I would focus on. It's snack time. Okay, it is snack time. I just gotta have to answer a few questions first. Okay. Um, you know, okay, everyone, everyone wants to see you. Um, so we are, we should focus on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, see you. You see you right there. Yeah. Um, okay, so what should we focus on for the writing section? You should definitely focus on uh, the Great Depression and the New Deal, all the programs, what they're supposed to do. And um, I would look at uh, 1920s and like how different groups of people are impacted by the 1920s. So we looked at African-Americans, we looked at immigrants, we looked at women, um, can we not do that right now? Uh, because people are trying to listen to me. Um, what chapters are most important? Um, chapters 20 and 22 are probably most important. So, so remember when we have the, uh, the test, we have um, 50 multiple choice questions and two short answer questions. Bless you. Okay, not right now. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Was this helpful for you? Uh, good question. If we if you missed SP thirty last time, I think it was slides like fourteen through thirty six. I think. Um, for the writing section, check out chapter twenty one and chapter twenty two. If school is delayed but not canceled tomorrow, um, I, don't. I think, I don't know what the plan would be. <laughs> Good question, Ian, I don't know. Um, okay, so here's the plan for the next next two days. Um, if if um, we don't have school tomorrow, um, I can create another review session tomorrow. Um, I won't go over the slides like I just did today. Um, it'll be more kind of like a normal review session that we have for probably about half an hour. Um, and then I'll have another review session in person on Friday morning. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking right now. Any questions on that? Okay. Well, that's it, everybody. If you have any questions, you can stay on afterwards and you can ask if you have any questions. Otherwise, um, I'll hopefully see you tomorrow or at least on Friday. Thanks, everybody.